right, so this is Mike Geary. Um, so I originally got to know him because he wrote a function for the Maplets API back when he was working for zevents.com. He wrote a function for the Maplets API while he was working on a zevents Maplet. And we liked this function so much that we actually integrated it to, into our Google code base and made it an official part of the, of the uh, Maplets API. Um, so after that, I was like, wow, this guy's a really good coder. Uh, and then around Christmas, we needed somebody to do a, a Maplet. And I was like, well, I know this guy that's probably, you know, the world's expert on the Maplets API. And, you know, maybe he's available. And uh, it turned out he was. So he's been working on, you know, various projects for us since then and uh, doing a really good job. And, uh, yeah, so here he is. So, yeah, I, I knew Nebraska because I've got these state abbreviations burned in my brain after doing these primary elections. They were just coming up uh, week after week for a while there. Um, we did a bunch of different uh, maps for the different primaries and started with uh, Iowa because the Iowa caucus uh, came up first. And uh, that one, at very first, what we did was um, the, um, a maplet for Iowa as well as... Let me get rid of some of this extra stuff on the screen here. Does that work? Yeah, good. I don't need that while I'm looking at it. So this one was pretty basic. It's just, um, and you see that's tuned up for a screen size. It's uh, bigger than this. But basically, it's your typical uh, red state, blue state map, except here we're doing the counties in Iowa. Uh, we can pull up the Republican or the Democratic results. And uh, basically, a pretty simple little a application. Now, if you watch as we're switching here, um, when I, when I switch from party to party, notice it's taking a little while for, the, uh, for those uh, polygons to draw on the screen. If you do this in an API map, this will come up really zippy. But in a maplet, Pamela actually was understating it when she said there's some security that it has to go through to, uh, to get between the uh, uh, map page and the maplet iframe. Because the maplet iframe is running in, in gmodules.com also. It's actually maps.gmodules.com. And that's, that's this frame over here on the side. So that's all running in a separate domain from the map itself. Now, in browsers, one domain uh, cannot talk to each other. You know, if you've got a banking site in one window and uh, my website in another, you don't want my website being able to access your banking codes. So they've got strict security across, uh, across uh, domains between, uh, between browser windows. That also holds true when one of the windows is an iframe inside here, like this, this side of it, the whole side that the maplet's in, that's a separate iframe in maps.gmodules.com. And that has no way that the browser is really going to allow uh, it that to talk to the main map at all. So they, they got some real geniuses on the Maps API team, and they came up with a hack. Because one thing that, that um, uh, pages, uh, an iframe that's part of a web page can do is change the URL of any, any window that's in that frame set, uh, or, you know, set or any of the iframes. So any... You know, if, you're, if you've got something in an iframe, you can follow a link that will navigate the outer window to a whole new page. And that's perfectly legal. You can navigate. You can't look at the history. You can't look at the, the JavaScript. You can't look at the cookies or any of that. But you can navigate. So one thing you can do with that is change the hash. You know, at the end of any URL, there's going to be a, a hash section, pound sign, whatever. And that, that part of the URL the maplet code can manipulate, and it's the maplet API that does this. It manipulates that, and then there's also code running in the map side of it that manipulates that. Not, now, they're not changing the top level like I'm doing here. That's just for illustration. But what they do is they create, create yet another hidden iframe, and they both go around changing the, the hash portion of the URL on one or two of these hidden iframes. Each side's watching that with a timer to see when it gets changed. As you can imagine, this is not just a direct JavaScript call like you've gotten the, the luxury of in the Maps API. This is a lot less efficient. It's kind of a miracle they were able to get this to work. I mean, it's, it's really, you know, browser security shouldn't have allowed this, but this one little hash hack makes all of this possible. But as you can see, it does, it does have some performance problems with it that go with that, that are pretty, pretty hard to fix. When we're doing, what, what I'm doing there is drawing polygons in the Maps API. By the way, anybody done a Maplet here? No? Oh, a couple, yeah. Pa Pamela, you've done them, I know. <laughs> so, uh, um, great. So we'll be covering some, uh, some of how they work and all. Um, but yeah, polygon drawing, what, what, what those are is we polygon by polygon, I'm sending them through with the, uh, from the Maplet API code running down in that other iframe across this hash. So they're serializing all this stuff going back and forth across these hash URLs. So it, it's actually amazing it works as well as it does. The... Um, 
The, there's another version of this that's just a straight maplet, uh, excuse me, a straight maps API version. And that one comes up pretty fast. Here's, it's just, in fact, I'll reload that. I'll do a hard reload, uh, control F5 on that, and we'll just reload it with no cache. Markers come up pretty fast. Polygons come up pretty fast. In fact, on the maplet version, I, I didn't even put in the markers because by the time I put polygons and markers, it was getting too slow for comfort. So, uh, so that's the Maps API version. That runs off the same code as the Maplet API version. The Maps API and the Maplet API are mostly pretty similar with one big, big, big difference we'll talk about in a minute. That was that, the, uh, the utility function Pamela was talking about. Um, and that, and uh, so, uh, so they're pretty similar. You actually can write common code for the two. You can also take and write the same code and make it work as a Google gadget. And that's basically the Maps API version of your code running inside a gadget, just like the ones that Pamela was showing. You can again take that same code and make it run either as a Maplet or a Maps API app. So uh, in the, um, the Maps API version, we can do some nice things. You know, you, this stuff, if you, who, you, a lot of you guys have done Maps API code, uh, but not Maplets, but Maps API. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, you can do mouse overs and all that kind of stuff. It's all real nice. In the Maplet API, you cannot do mouse overs. So you kind of have to limit the way you think about it. You can do uh, the info windows, that kind of stuff, but no, and click on the map, but no, but no rollovers like this. So some of the interaction is, is going to be more limited in Maplet. But you can take that into account and, you know, do one or the other in your, your two versions of the code. Um, I'm going to move forward to uh, one that we did after that uh, just to show where we do run into the performance issue. This is New Hampshire. It was the next primary after Iowa. Very, very similar map that I did with here was just the same thing with, uh, oh, this is the, no, this is the Maps API version, so that's really quick. Um, let's, do I have the New Hampshire maplet? Oh, I don't have it handy, but uh, it's the same, it looks just like this, but, you know, it's going to be a little slower. New Hampshire, they don't vote county by county. As you can see, there's a lot of polygons there. That's actually townships in New Hampshire. Uh, some of the New England states vote very, with much smaller voting units, so there's a lot more of them on the map, and you deal with the performance implications of that. Um, now, one thing I wanted to mention, uh, th this, this was not a non-technical issue. Um, when we first did the Ohio caucus and did the maps for that, people had different comments about them. And one of the comments somebody wrote on, a, on their blog was they said, I was really glad to see this because it's completely unbiased. There's no bias in this. It's just you see what you see on the map, and there's nothing biased. And I, I thought it was really funny because at the same time, I was racking my brains trying to fix the bias I knew was in there. And there's, there, can anybody see? There's, I, I, there's actually three kinds of bias in this map. Can anybody see any, what any of those might be? What's that? <laughs> well, yeah, there's a lot of, uh, you know, that's, uh, yeah, a lot of states. Was this the Republican? Yeah, a lot, a lot, of, state, a lot of counties or townships for McCain. One, one form of bias you see right here, if you take a look at the votes over here, it was 38% statewide for McCain, 32% for Mitt Romney. So Romney was not far behind McCain at all in the statewide. But the, what you see in the counties here is almost a, a landslide for McCain, really not the act. It's, what it is is each one of those is, looks like a winner-take-all contest because we're only putting one color on the map per county or if we're doing state by state, you remember the red state, blue state, well, every state's got a whole mix of people that are voting different ways, and not every state even actually assigns their delegates on a winner-takes-all basis. But when we're doing this kind of map, we make it look like, or any kind of map that's doing this, this color highlighting, it looks like everything is winner-takes-all, whether it is or not. Uh, another item is we're not showing delegates, which is what really counts. We're showing popular vote, mostly because that's what we had the numbers for. Um, and uh, a third one that's kind of interesting, take a look at the top of... Um, the top of New Hampshire, you've got this little county up here, this big county, this is, or I should say township, these are townships. In terms of area, this is one of the biggest ones in the state. If I look down here, there's, there's nothing else as big as that one up there. This is uh, Pittsburgh, New Hampshire. Now Pittsburgh, as you can see, have had a total of 95 votes for John McCain. On the map, it looks like that's one of the biggest, most important, unless you know New Hampshire, you know it's way out in the boonies, but it looks, from the map, it looks big. And so you think that's more important. Now way down here is, a little tiny one, a little tiny county. It's Nashua, or in a tiny town, I should say. But Nashua's got more population than anybody else. That's got 4,000 votes for McCain. But on the map, it just, just looks like a little tiny thing. So, so that's actually 50 times in, as important in vote totals, that little one that shows up tiny on the map, 50 times as important as this huge-looking one on the top. So, so sometimes it's, it's, 
we don't see the bias that's there. You know, if somebody's conservative, they think the media is liberally biased. If they're liberal, they think it's conservative biased. But really, well, the media is biased toward a good story, and us in the map business, we're biased toward a good-looking map. <laughs> so <laughs> take that with, you know, take everything we, as far as interpreting this with that grain of salt. Can you, can you apply it? Can you apply yeah, there's a, there's a few. I'll oh, get the microphone. Sorry, sorry. Couldn't you tie in like color codes where you where you have them dial up? Do a, do like a color database where you say, all right, as the the population amount in this goes up, the intensity of the color goes up. The actual code mm -hmm. in the database. Yeah. And couldn't yeah. you even mix like two? But that would be like another step mixing, off. Mixing mixing is tricky because you're going to get yeah. many colors. How do you mix? Yeah. The, you know, it's going to look like yet another candidate. Or even color. a percentage type but thing. The, but the of intensity. Pixels. Yeah. We actually did something with the intensity on these. Uh, you can't see it here because all the votes were in. But, but what we did is the, the other, there's another form of bias, which is early on in the evening when everybody's sitting there watching the returns, which doesn't really matter. The votes aren't going to count until they're all counted. But everybody's watching to see who gets the early lead. Well, you start to see all these counties trickle in on the map, and it looks like they're all done. What we did actually was use the opacity setting to make them fade in. If, if a county only had a few votes reported, we'd show it pretty faded. And then as more and more of the returns come in, it would bring up the color. So we used it for that. In, uh, on the next map, I'm going to show you, actually, the one after the next, I'll show you something where we did another way that Pamela thought of of addressing the question of how big it looks. But let me, let me do one more. For Super Tuesday, um, Super Tuesday was really good and really bad because I got really ambitious. And I thought, well, you know, we have these performance issues with the maplet. Wouldn't it be nice if we could do something that would be faster? And one way that you can do that is with um, a tile layer. Let's let get back here. Um, that didn't work out. But what we did instead, uh, this was like an overnight project the night before Super Tuesday. I put together this Twitter Vision clone. And ba who's, who's, who's seen Twitter Vision? So this will look really familiar. But the only thing different here is it's not all of Twitter. It's Twitter filtered according to certain keywords. So I looked for things like caucus. Um, look for things like primary, uh, all of the candidate names, and whatever, and every Twitter that came, or tweet that came in that had any of those, and then I ran it through a band word filter because we had a lot that I didn't want to put on a Google map and have Google get pretty mad at me for it. So, we, so, we, so I had a dirty word filter that I filtered all this through that all the ones that you wouldn't want to see got taken out, but all the ones that looked like they might have to do with Super Tuesday or primaries, we put them on there. Um, I totally blew it on the map results. As you can see, there's no map results on the map. Of course, now we're off in Europe, but even if we go back to, uh, we go back to the US here, uh, there's nothing, nothing highlighted in North America. So that part of it didn't work out. But people seem to love the Twitter, the Twitter thing. Uh, the first ones that was up there, they, they said, oh, I've been watching this all day. Now, so of course, some other people said, this is lame and useless. So go figure. We please some of the people, at least. Um, but that's sort of what we did. There, in the sidebar, I also had election results. We didn't completely lose them, but I didn't get them onto the map at all. What happened was I was trying to do a tile layer and didn't get everything right. We'll get into some of the gory details on that in just a bit. So now the current one is, uh, to get it totally up to date with what the latest one looks like, is um, Pamela came up with this great idea. Actually, it was at first the idea was would it maybe help performance. It didn't actually make much of a difference on performance, but what it did was um, greatly improved the uh, one of the forms of bias that I was worried about. It also looks kind of cool if we get this to come up here. Okay, so this one has, now I, I did a little tile layer that you can see in there when the states, the state outlines came in with a little bit of shading. But now what we did instead, instead of coloring them in, we did the typical uh, Google um, marker pins. Except as you can see, they're all different sizes. There's a big one for California, big one for Texas, Little one for Wyoming. This, it's it's proportionate to the number of votes, so uh, and so probably roughly to the number of delegates. We still should be really putting more emphasis on delegates, but but this way. So now California has a lot of electoral votes. It has a lot of delegates. It has a lot of popular votes. So it looks big because it's got a big pin. And I thought this was just great. It was it solved at least one of my problems. I was really really upset about with the uh, this bias that the map has. You still. You know, it's still winner takes all, it's still all that, but at least we, you know, we, we can see by, uh, by the size of the pin rather than the size, the physical size of the state. Because otherwise, I mean, if you're doing by physical size of the state, you come up to Alaska and it's huge on the map. Even worse because it's Mercator projection, so it looks about three times as big as it is. But, you know, it gets a pin that's proportional to its votes. And one other thing we have on these is, um, so I put this get, get this map for your website link. And what that does is gets you over to the uh, Google gadget version of the map. And let's get rid of that stuff on the side. 
how come it keeps going? There we go. So this again, same map, uh, very, very similar. The, uh, it's, but this is, this is running as a Maps API application inside a Google gadget. So you can put this on iGoogle or, or other places. We did this for other, other websites that wanted to be able to incorporate this on their site. Um, and yeah, you can select a state. And if you select a state, you'll go and it'll zoom in and you can look at the, uh, the details for that state. And again here, um, you, saw the, you saw it fade in. If I, if I refresh it, watch it as it loads. The, um, the map will load up. Well, I didn't go back to my state I was looking at again. Here, let's look at, say, uh, well, I'll do California. So watch it as it comes in. First, going to come in a tile layer. Um, it, it's almost at the same time. But you see there's county outlines in there. And if I zoom in on it, uh, these you see county outlines here. And Because if you just put the pins on for the state, it doesn't really give much context about where those counties really are. So, so we put the county outlines, and that is a tile layer on top of it. Then we use markers to bring on the, uh, the pins. Um, the uh, and one other thing we had here. Let's see. Yeah, the only and and that's basically how that works. The other thing we have is a news sidebar, where we put in uh, the uh, latest news feeds and stuff. And this this is basically the same thing you can do in the. There's a built-in uh, uh, gadget that Google Gadgets has. You can put this on your iGoogle, take a news feed and put it in. This this I did. I just did my own JavaScript code because I couldn't put that gadget inside this gadget. So. Uh, um, and we'll, we'll go over how, how, uh, how we did some of that. And I'm checking my time here. We're not going to be able to get through all of the stuff I was wanting to talk about. So let me give you a heads up. What I'm going to do is uh, tomorrow on my blog, I'm going to post an update with actually the outline of some of the stuff I'm talking about and also links to uh, I'm, there going to be a few resources I'm talking about. And we'll have links to all of those. And then also the next several days after that, over the next week, I'm going to post some more detailed articles about some of this stuff because we're trying to rush through it in a, a quick session here. Go ahead. And, and your blog is? My blog is mg.to. Yes. And my email address is mg at mg.to. <laughs> and uh, that's, where you can, that's where you can track it down. M is in Michael, G is in Geary. So anyway, let's, let's look at some of the code for all this. We've been looking at maps enough. Um, one, thing, one thing we talked about is how can we write common code for a maplet and as well as an API map. Um, whoops, hang on here. I want to get rid of that and not do that. So, um, so for com to write common code, now one thing, if you look at the, map, uh, the maplet examples, most of them have a, it's a big XML file with HTML and JavaScript all like in one big file. And that's pretty good for load time and caching and all of that. Uh, it's not so good for, for development and debugging because you've got this big XML file that you cannot host on your local machine. You've got to host it on a web server because Google has to be able to read that from their site and load it up from there. So, you know, if I'm developing an API map, excuse me, if I'm doing an API map, I just develop locally, and I can just hit reload. I, I can save from my text editor. Everything's very, very fast. But a maplet, and also a Google gadget, you can't do that. You've got to have the XML file out on a website where Google can see it. So one thing I do instead of putting everything in the one XML file is, OK, so I've got, I've got an XML file, and I've got the same stuff that Pamela showed. It's got the, the basic stuff at the top, the required feature share map there, uh, a couple other things, a set title. There are features that you're including. And then um, in this particular one, I'm using jQuery. So I do include jQuery actually just directly in the XML file because I never change that. But then down at the end, what I do is, OK, now here I load in all my own JavaScript from a separate file. Now this one, this is the production version of this maplet. <clears throat> so when I load my JavaScript, I actually I use the IG get cached URL, which is just like it's the iGoogle caching, except instead of going and fetching it for you, it just gives you back a URL. Because what I want to do is write a script tag out. And I want to get a URL, my URL into the script tag. But I also want to have iGoogle cache it, so it's going to be real efficient for me on, on my, my server or wherever I'm hosting it. So I, so I use the get cached URL and write, it, write out that script tag. Th now, again, this is the production version. In the development version, I do basically the same thing. Um, this is actually a more recent version of my development version. And this one, uh, in this one I've, I'm using jQuery also, but I, wrote, uh, I just load jQuery in through a script tag. And then I load my own script. Uh, my, my same JavaScript file is here. I've got a, a map.js. It's map.js. Map and in the development maplet, it's also map.js. But I'm loading it from my local machine, Padlet. 
Padlet happens to be this ThinkPad right here. Uh, you could use localhost. I use the host name because I, I want to be able to load it from my other computers on my LAN and stuff. So they can all see Padlet. And so I can test this locally. Uh, Google can see the XML file because they need to. They don't need to see my JS file. So I can save that locally and, and reload it uh, very easily that way. Uh, the, uh, and the way you do that is one thing you really, really need if you're doing maplets is the... Um, if I, see, if I load one of my maplets, I'll see it. Like, uh, uh, well, 360 cities or New Hampshire. We'll go up to New Hampshire primary. Here we go. So when I, when I load my maplet using, and I, I was using direct links to the maplets before, so we didn't have some of this, this extra stuff here. But now, since I've got the uh, developer maplet, I've got a reload link. And I, if I click that, it'll reload my maplet. Um, and that will also bypass the Google caching when you do that. So you, you could put everything in your XML. But it's really easier to have the JavaScript, because that's what you're going to be editing mostly, the JavaScript locally. You can save it, hit reload. You don't have to wait for it to go back up to your server, um, even if it's just a second or so. I just like to hit reload right away. So, so that's, and then, um, you know, what got the JavaScript locally? I can set breakpoints, do all that stuff. Um, same thing for the, uh, the API map, of course. I just have the, all the code locally. I don't need the, uh, the XML file up on the server. Um, but those do use separate wrappers. So I've got the, uh, well, this one wrapper is the XML file for the Maplet version. And then I do another wrapper that's an HTML file. This, this is for the, uh, for Iowa, we had a straight Maps API gadget that people could embed. And this was the sample for that. And here again, we're back to using uh, API keys and that kind of stuff. The, uh, the third version of it is a gadget. It's very similar to this. It's got the XML for the outside and then the, the uh, the Maps API code on the inside of the gadget. So by doing that, you can write common code for the, the, uh, the three different ones. Um, there is one big difference in the Maplet API, though. Um, and this one, uh, this one causes you to have to really develop separately for a lot of, uh, a lot of your Maplet and Maps code is the same. But there's one issue that comes up. Uh, let's see, where's the uh, Google Maplets? Here we go. There's a, there's a note about it in the developer guide because um, like I said, the Maplet and Maps are not running with direct JavaScript calls. What happens is when you want to call a function that's got to be handled over in the map, not your Maplet code, it's got to post, it's essentially posting a message across this bridge. It's got, it sets a value in the hash of one of the hidden iframes. Then there's a timer running on the other side that picks that up. So it's all asynchronous. So something as simple as uh, what you would do like to, to get the zoom level, you can, in the API map, you can say map dot get zoom just returns your, your zoom level directly and it's, you're done. There's no waiting, it's instant. On a maplet, you've got to do, uh, on each of those functions that returns a value has a separate version for a maplet it, and it's the same name with an async at the end. You've got to use this async version because that can then go across this slow connection to the map, get a response back from the map, that comes back to the maplet and then you get your value through a callback because JavaScript can't wait around on that. It's got to continue ex executing because there's no way in JavaScript to say, go do this, wait until you're done. You've got to use a callback. So all of these functions will have a callback. The get zoom async has a zoom uh, a parameter that it passes into a callback function. So it, normally you'd have to do that separately. The, uh, the, the, uh, this g async function I wrote um, uh, lets you do a couple things. I actually wrote it initially so that you could do more than one of these calls at once. Because if you're doing the asynchronous calls, you, do, you make one call, wait for reply, make another call, wait for reply. Like here, we're doing get zoom, and we're also doing get center. Well, if you do that with a straight API, you're going to have to do one, wait for it, do the other, wait for that. So I wrote this thing that bundles them up and lets you do the both of them at once, or as many calls as you want. Whoops. Oh, I got to not push the wrong buttons when I'm doing this. Here we go. So. So instead of that, what I did was I, I wrote gasync, which says, okay, let me do one version of the code for both of them, and then you can include that in both. If you wanted to get the zoom level, the map center, and uh, a particular point for a marker, you could write this code, and this would work identically in both the maplet and the maps API. So that, that can really help out on some parts of your code where you're having to write that separate code. Uh, if you're doing a maplet or a Google gadget, you can also do data loading through the IG, uh, the IG fetch content, IG fetch uh, XML content um, that go through the Google cache. 
Unfortunately, if you're doing your own Maps API application, you can't do that. You've got to load your own data. Again, you can use XML HTTP request or you can use JSON with a script tag to do your downloading with either of those. I, I use JSON for everything myself, whether I'm doing a, the script tag or another way to load it. It's just a really handy way to load stuff into uh, JavaScript, obviously, because obviously, it, is, it is the JavaScript native format. Um, so let's go back to the code here. The, um, there's a lot of tricks in the JavaScript too, things we could do better or worse but, uh, as far as um, some neat ways to code the JavaScript. But I think since in the interest in time right now, I'm going to skip over to some of the other stuff. Uh, take a look at, and I'll, I'll write an article with some of the things that have to do with that. One thing you have to deal with, of course, if you, a lot of you guys have worked with shapefiles and uh, most, if you've done, who's worked with shapefiles and done, if you've done the polygons and that kind of stuff, yeah. So uh, uh, shape files uh, are a way to describe a shape on a geographic uh, boundary of something. And uh, the, uh, the Census Bureau has a whole bunch of them you can get for the, all the counties and all the states. There's just a ton of them that they've got on there for the, from the Census Bureau. And so this is where I got, got all the shape files for the, uh, the regional uh, outlines, the states and counties and all of that. They've got counties, they've got towns, they've got, basically you get shape files for everything. And a shape file is like a database uh, with, uh, has places in it, it's got polygons, it can have markers. It's a, almost a little bit like a KML file in a binary format. Uh, it doesn't have everything a KML file has, but it's got a bit of the same kind of concept too. But it's a, it's a pretty awkward binary format. There's a program you can use called Shape to Text. That's one way to take a shape file, put it into a more workable XML format. But mid, and, and I was using that for a while, but midway through this project, I found um, somebody had written a nice Python library um, called um, Shape Utils. which I don't have open here. Let me get that. Shape utils. And this, this is Python code that breaks apart this binary format. It's actually a shape file. It's a collection of files. One of them is a dbase file. Anybody ever use dbase back in the, the old timers like me? Yeah, okay. Okay, so shape file. They call it a shape file, but it's actually a collection of files. There's an shp file, which has the actual points and stuff in it. There's a dbx file, if I remember right, which is a database of information about each point. That's not stored in the same file. It's in a database format. And there's a third one, an shx, that's an index. So, and these files all go together. Uh, so it's a really real pain to deal with these files if you have to code this yourself. So I'm really glad. Uh, Zachary Forrest Johnson has my undying admiration. And he also writes a really good blog on, on uh, cartography and uh, mapping type of stuff. So he wrote, he wrote this library called Shape Utils. Um, and it, it picks apart all the, uh, the uh, shape file. Also, I, I took this and added some stuff to it because the, uh, the other things that you need, you need some other information that you can calculate. I didn't want to do this down in the JavaScript code. Basically, I want to do everything I could on a server batch process, generate stuff that was easy to get to in uh, JSON from the JavaScript side of things and have it all be pre-processed to work so I didn't have to write as much code in the JavaScript and have it be slow because of that. So one thing I do in here is I go through um, each, uh, each of the shapes and calculate a bunch of things. We, we go through and for each of the points in the shape, we go through and, uh, and collect up some things. This, this part of it does the bounds. It's easy to calculate the bounds of a shape. It's the minimum and maximum X and Y. That's easy. There's another thing we need, the centroid. Who knows what a centroid is? Good, okay. Who knows how, how likely you are to use the wrong algorithm to calculate one if you try to figure it out yourself? <laughs> Have you ever tried it? Oh man, I, a, a centroid, let's go back to one of my maps. A centroid is the um, kind of like the center of a polygon, but it's not the center in terms of the the bounding rectangle. You know, one way to figure out what's the center of a polygon, you could say, okay, let me get the bounding rectangle and take the center of that. Well, that'll be some kind of a center of it, but that's not going to really give you the right center in a lot of cases. As you can imagine, if it's an irregular shape, like um, Alaska's got the Aleutian Islands that go way off on the end, well, the bounding rectangle is going to include all that. And if you take all of Alaska and then take the center point of that bounding rectangle, it's probably going to be out in the ocean because of the Aleutian Islands pulling it out that way. So if you, uh, so you, so you, so that that was my first attempt. I said, well, let me just use the center. That worked. That didn't work out too well. The next thing I said was, okay, how, I've got to find a way to get the 
I heard, I've heard of this centroid thing, and I said, well, how can I figure out a centroid? I tried to do it myself. So I said, uh, well, let me take all of the points and average them. If I just go point by point and point by point of all the points around the edges of the polygon and just take the average of all, that, all of those, that must be the right answer. Well, that's not it either. Although, oddly enough, the Wikipedia article says to do that. If you go to look up centroid on Wikipedia, they give two descriptions of it. One of them looks correct, and then right below it, they give a totally wrong thing that say you can take the arithmetic average of all the points. You can't do that, and I'll show you why. Let's say you have a state that has a shape kind of like this. It's pretty squarish, and then along the edge, it's got a coastline, okay? Now what's going to happen if I take and go around and calculate all the points, what I'm going to get, assume these are straight lines here. These are all straight lines. I didn't draw them straight. But I'm going to take that point, I'm going to take that point, and then I'm going to take all of these points over here, and I'm going to average them, and guess what? My centroid's going to be right about here, I believe. <laughs> That's not right. I tried that. That didn't work out too well. So finally, I got smart and did a little research and found, looked until I found somebody that had an algorithm for centroids that actually looked like it was right. And so I, I, I put that into the, uh, this uh, Zachary's code that I found. And it's, it's this amazing little calculation. It's really a tiny amount of code. It's this right here. These lines of code right there do the, the accumulating of the points in the right way that actually makes a centroid work. And then this line of code at the end does it. And I have no idea why that works. If, if, <laughs> If I, if I go to the, the site where he explains it and I look at his pictures and read through it, well, I'm, I, can, I can almost think I understand it then. But, I mean, I'm glad there's people that figured this stuff out because it's so simple, but I never would have figured this out. What's that? Uh, I'll, I, I don't know, Roth. I'll put on my links tomorrow, yeah, when I post the links. So, uh, yeah, there, there's some really good sites that have algorithms and stuff. And, and this is like security software. Have you ever tried to make up your own security algorithm? You should be fired if you ever do. I, I, got, I, I asked, somebody asked me that in an interview once. They said, well, how would you implement this kind of security? And I said, I told him I'd call up my friend that knows how to do this. <laughs> so, uh, hey, actually, I want to go back and do one other, one other thing on the, uh, let's see if we have it here. Uh, do I have, yeah, here we go. For, for, we didn't do these on the follow-up st states later on, but for, for New Hampshire, I did do an experiment with doing a KML file. And I want to actually come back to it. And no, I don't want to save that. I want to open it. I want to come back to it. Now we're getting data for all the states and actually put this together. OK, let's see if it works. Everybody else got to run Google Earth. Um, I, th I think this would be pretty nice to put these in for all the states because it's, kind of it's kind of a fun way to see it. This is not a really slick KML like the one with the, uh, the climate change lines and all, but uh, it's my little effort. So it zoom, zooms in on New Hampshire, and it's, it's just kind of fun to watch that zoom in. And, uh, you know, you can uh, do all the usual stuff you can do in Google Earth. Zoom in farther and see. And here, of course, I did use the, uh, use the markers there. This you could fix, by the way. Where it loads up slow. If you put that in a KMZ and put the resources in the KMZ, it'll take care of that. I just hadn't done that. That's my little Google Earth thing. Okay, let's go back to some code. How much? Do, I've only got a few more minutes. Is that right? Do we need to break up at uh, seven thirty or? Well, it's is more that for the Googlers that want to catch the last shuttles? <laughs> yeah. So. so uh, we can we can run we can run over a few minutes. A few minutes, okay. Yeah. Just tell me tell me when to stop. I'll I'll keep talking until I see too many people asleep or somebody tells me to stop. Yeah, because we're getting getting to that time. Um, Let's see. So the other thing we did was the, the gathering up the votes. I'm, I'm going to skip the code on that because there's, there's a bunch of different pieces to it. We got vote, voting data from a bunch of different sources. There was, for Iowa, we did uh, uh, XML files we got from the Des Moines Register and CSV files that the, the Republican Party was sending to me. Now, this was Google Election Central for the Iowa caucus was consisted of uh, some wonderful helper at the Republican, uh, the Republicans had to get together at the convention center. They were getting their vote totals from their precincts. They were emailing them to me. I was running my little script and uploading them to Google Maps. So uh, it was all kind of going through. <laughs> I, was, I, was like, I was like Google Election, election Central that night. Um, definitely, definitely not a typical Google project, because I mean, I don't work for Google. I'm an outsider. I had to do, be doing my own stuff, and I couldn't use the Google infrastructure for any of this. So, uh, so it got interesting. And, and then also delegate counts. We got Ernest, uh, um, 
not, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, Ernest Delgado uh, did a, uh, uh, a, a neat thing where he, pr he ha did a screen scraper to pick out delegate counts from, uh, from it's called realclearpolitics.com, and he scraped all the stuff out of, their, out of their site, so finally we could get delegate counts into the maps. Um, let's look at one other bit of code, it's kind of interesting, um, and, uh, make a, and that'll be a little different from the other stuff. When we did, uh, I did the Twitter one. Now, it, it was, Twitter, doing Twitter was a little controversial because Google uh, has Jaiku, and uh, some people said, well, why not use Jaiku? And it, the only reason was that Twitter had a couple of APIs that made it possible for me to do the, the map stuff. We, they have Twitter Vision, which gives you geolocation for a lot of Twitter users, and, uh, and they had the Jabber feed that let me pull down selected keywords and stuff. Um, so, so that was really the reason for that, doing one versus the other. But uh, they, they, did have, they did have the tools I needed to be able to do that. So uh, this one, instead of Python, I wrote the Twitter updater in Ruby. And again, I, a lot of stuff, when I'm writing a script, I really go by what libraries are available and what's, where has somebody done most of the work for me. And it happened that the, uh, the, uh, for Ruby, there was a, a, uh, an XMPP, which is a Jabber library, that was written by the guy at Twitter. And so I figured if I'm going to be getting the data from Twitter and I'm using his library, if I need help, he can probably help me. So, uh, so I used his library, and that was really why I used Ruby for this. I like Ruby and Python both, so this is a chance to get, do, do a little Ruby code. And it, he makes it really simple. You go, you just, if you want to, if you want to start up, it's a Jabber, you know, it's, it's as if you were running a Jabber client, uh, you know, interactively, except it's just, it's through your code. You do this Jabber simple new, and I've got my username and password in a separate file, so nobody sees them. Because this, this code's all checked into uh, a Google code. So it's all, everything, all the code's open source, and do what you want with it. And uh, um, I'll be documenting it better than it is, too. But uh, anyway, you do uh, Jabber simple, I am deliver. And that's basically, that sets you up getting your, your Twitter updates. Or, or any, uh, you know, anything that's a, a Jabber, or Google Talk, any system that's running Jabber. And uh, then, what I, then what I do is pick those up um, through... Uh, you know, it's just this little loop here gets the Twitter updates. Very simple. Get a message and and uh, and process it, and then um, and then in, in one message, there's a bunch of ways to parse XML. And the one I like is actually not really designed so much as an XML parser. It's designed for HTML. Anybody use H H Pricot? Oh, good. Yeah, it's just a wonderful parser. It's very easy to work with. It's a lot like jQuery. If you use, if you use jQuery in JavaScript, you'll probably like HPricot because it was modeled, modeled after jQuery. So I, so I do an HPricot. It's hard to pronounce, though. That's the only problem. Uh, I, I get, get a doc for that. And then I, like, I want to pull the author out of that. I just say doc slash author slash name, and that does like a path down through through the, uh, the tags down to author and then down to name and pulls the text out of it. That'd be like you know, several lines of code doing it the more conventional way. So uh, is just really nice for uh, both HTML and XML parsing. I also used it on the news gadget on the sidebar I had where I wanted to take that news feed and break it apart and also dig down into the HTML preview and break that apart. I used, in that case, I, it was on the client, so was I doing that? Yeah, it was on the client, so I used jQuery. jQuery, hpricot, either way is just makes a lot of your coding a lot easier if you're dealing with DOM type of stuff. Um, so basically, I take all that and I just, then from there I generate JSON code that gets loaded into the maplet. To, and generating JSON, of course, is easy. There's a libraries for both Python and Ruby for that. Um, that's, the, uh, that's the Twitter map. Uh, oh, I've got one more map I didn't look at here. Let's just pull that one up. I have a few more minutes anyway. And... Uh, we can talk about that one for a minute. This is the, this is not live on the site yet. This is the campaign trail. And this one, what I'm doing is taking the iGoogle, or excuse me, the, the calendar.google.com calendar, public calendar feeds. The, the remaining uh, major candidates have, each one has a, a, a Google calendar public feed that shows where they're going to be speaking and debating and stuff. So I pull that feed down and uh, Bring, I bring the feeds, I, I combine the three candidate feeds into the sidebar here and, uh, uh, and, and then put up pins on the map. Again here, nothing, no rocket science to this one. It's a pretty, a pretty typical little application that you could do. I didn't realize until very late in the game that you could actually do this. I hover the mouse over a marker and I get a title. All you have to do is put a, put a, you can put a title attribute when you create a marker and you get that. So even though it's a maplet and I can't do much in the way of hover effects, I can get one hover effect. At least I can get a title out of something, because I really like not having to click on things. So, so we can do that. And of course, you can click and get the details on it for the whole thing. 
Um, let me just talk real briefly about what we did for hosting on this, because this is kind of a, this is not just a mashup, but it's kind of a lash up too, because we were, you know, like I said, I don't have access to Google infrastructure. When I was doing the first one for Io, I thought, you know, can I put this on my shared hosting account at TextDrive and have how many hundreds of thousands of Google visitors? No, that didn't sound too good. That actually would have worked for a Maplet or a Gadget. If you're, if you're doing those, you can do iGoogle caching and get your own load down on your server down to, you can, you, you can basically regulate how often you want your server to be hit. You can, when you do a, when you do a fetch through the iGoogle caching, you can specify the refresh interval of anywhere from, I think you can go down, is it a minute or a second, one or the other? It's, I, think it, I think it's a second. You can say every second refresh it, or you can go all the way up to an hour. And so depending on how, if, if you uh, have data that's not gonna change very often, you can have it be fetched only once an hour. And so I actually, if I was just doing uh, I, the uh, gadget and maplet, those all run through iGoogle, but the API map, you can't do that. You could actually, you, it actually works if you try it, but they'll probably shut you down if you do it because you're not really supposed to do it. And they, they see a lot of traffic. You know, they allow stuff. Google's pretty loose about stuff for people so they can test and, and uh, be able to develop their apps. And you can go try a URL, it'll work. But if you get a high volume app going uh, with it that's not doing it the right way, then eventually they'll, they'll start to block you. Um, so, but if you're doing a gadget or a maplet, you have no problem with that. You can use iGoogle caching. Um, so what I, what I did was hosted everything on Google code. Not just the code, but the data. So all of these, these pieces of code we're looking at that fetch the, uh, the uh, um, generate, you know, fetch the votes, generate the JSON data. I was just doing SVN check-ins on all those each time. So it's really easy. I, I, was, I was keeping my code in subversion. It really got down to the wire. I was wondering how I was going to host all this. And Pamela, she's like my total hero on this stuff. The, uh, before the first one, she said, well, why don't you try Google Code? And I said, let's do it. That worked, and it worked great. Um, for later on, when we started doing the tile layers and stuff, I said, well, that's going to break Google Code if I do that, because these tile layers are multi-megabytes. And if I check in updates to them, one project on Google Code is limited to 100 megabytes, and I'd blow past that pretty fast. So, so again, uh, we, we started getting, uh, what, what are we going to do? If I was thinking, I probably would have realized I could have hosted this on my uh, shared hosting because it's going through the iGoogle caching. But what we did actually was use Amazon S3 for that. Now, S has anybody used S Amazon S3? Painful, isn't it? Yeah. If you, unless you've got a library. You've got one of the libraries that does it for you. But if you're trying to really, if you want to do any of that directly yourself, it's, it's, it's not, it doesn't use SFTP. It's nothing that you're used to from any of your tools. They've got a whole REST API that you work with to upload stuff to it. And really, you've got to do it just the way they want it. So basically, you get somebody that's written a library for you. Either there's a command line one, there's a one in Python, and I'll, I'll, have, I'll post the links for all of these. Um, and uh, you, you do that. S3 charges you, you know, by the gigabyte. And we were, Pamela and I were worried. We thought, well, how much is this going to cost us? You know, because we're, we're thinking, well, it, first off, it seemed kind of unusual, Google using Amazon for hosting. But again, it wasn't Google project. It was me doing it. So I had to do something outside of Google with it. Um, but it was funny when, because of the iGoogle caching, when we did the, the uh, it was the March 4th caucus was the first one we did using that. We, we uh, had the tile layer, we had the, the pins, we had all the, the stuff working. And we, we got the bill for that one, that one day of heavy, heavy activity on the map and it was 55 cents. <laughs> so it would have been a lot more if not for the iGoogle caching, because that's where, that's where it was paying for all the bandwidth. Uh, would have been a lot, lot, lot more than that, I think. But uh, basically, for the map tiles, I wasn't updating in real time. I just set the caching on that to one hour, and it's as if you had a visitor to the site every hour. You know, it's like nothing. So, uh, so the iGoogle caching can really help you on this stuff. Uh, you really, you really want to make use of that, and uh, whether it's S3 or wherever you're hosting stuff. Um, I've got lots more I could talk about, but we're really kind of out of time, and I'll well, post updates on my blog. Well, I mean, Actually, we can be here till 8 o'clock. You want to keep okay. going? We don't have to stop. I can go back to some of the stuff I skipped. Anybody's yeah. tired, wants to leave? Yeah, no, I won't take offense. Leave, <laughs> you know, go grab your bus now. Your Thanks for coming. Check mg.to over the next couple of days. We got the room till 8 o'clock. We got the recording till 8 o'clock. Okay. I'll take 30 seconds to take a drink of water. And yeah. Anybody wants to leave, feel free. Get the microphone. And I should have mentioned I was... Uh, Ask questions. How come some of the township are in white color? I'm, I'm sorry, say again? How come some of the township are in white color? Townships were white. How come some of the townships were white? They didn't have a color. 
Uh, that that was, those are the ones that don't, in, this is in New, New Hampshire, those are the ones that do not report their own votes. And in fact, if you hover over one of those, a note comes up that says, uh, residents of this township vote in another township. There are ones that have, some of them have like no people in them. <laughs> one of them has three people. It's got one house in this entire township. So that, that's what that was. There was also one that was actually a bug in the way I was doing the region calculations that, that uh, I, one of them was white that wasn't supposed to be. It was it, because I didn't have to even show it on the map. And yet, go ahead, had a question? Uh, just wondering why you do all this stuff. If you don't work for Google, why are you spending all your time in this? You just big. Uh, well, they do guy. pay me. They do oh, pay you? Yeah. As a cons project, oh, as a so consultancy. you're a consulting thing. Yeah, consulting for Google. Because you, you mentioned that you got laid off from the Z whatever. Yeah. And so you just do consulting for Google now, or do, is there a bunch more stuff about what you do on your website? Well, this, this has been keeping me busy the last few months. I actually did just do another maplet. Uh, oddly enough, it was for 360 cities. The version of their maplet that Pam showed is uh, the one they have live now, but I've, I've just been working on a new one for them that's, uh, I'm not sure when it'll go live, but it's uh, an improved version of their maplet. And yes, I'm available. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, the, the, the elections have been keeping me pretty busy, but those are, of course, dwindling down as the primaries are, are ending. Wait, so how did you get the Twitters restricted to only stuff about um, the Super Tuesday? Yeah, so Twitter in their, in their API, they have, a, they have a Jabber bot that they run that you can connect to and send it commands. And let me see, I think, if, if you want to take a second, I should be able to pull that up. It's in, uh, I've got that up in Pigeon. If I can type, P-I-D-G-I-N, yeah. So twi Twitter has a Jabberbot. A Jabberbot is, looks like another IM user. You can, and you can send a, a command to their IM user. And, uh, and one of their commands is track. And you can track, I don't think I have it. No, I guess not. So, so you say track, and then you give a list of keywords. Track, election, comma, primary, comma, caucus, pro comma, Super Tuesday, et cetera, et cetera, candidate names. And then what happens is they're running on their end um, a uh, script of some sort or whatever that was watching those keywords for you and then sends you back an instant message. So basically, you're just instant messaging back and forth. Uh, you send a track command to their instant message bot. Their bot starts running for you and then sends you back IMs with each of the tweets in it. And that's really all there is to it. You can do it interactively, too. Um, I wish I had, let's see, this is, no, that one's me. I don't seem to have it. Uh, Yeah, no, I don't have that. Or do I here? Let's see here. Yeah, no, that's I don't have that here. So, so, but that that's how that works. Uh, um, they do that through Jabber, and part of the reason for that, they um, people were were using just HTTP polling. Twitter Vision, I think, just pulls Twitter. It just keeps keeps hitting. Now they may have changed it by now, but early on, this is what people are doing. You wanted you, if you wanted to do like a custom Twitter feed of some sort like you do with a lot of sites, you just hit, hit the site and scrape it. Um, so, so what they added, but that's pretty inefficient on both ends. They don't want to have to deal with the traffic and you don't want to have to deal with keeping polling like that. So, so they, they, they did this Jabber client as a more efficient way to do that. You can set up the IM connection, send your track command across, it'll track your keywords and send you back IMs without so much overhead that the HTTP polling requires. So that, that's, that's, how the, uh, that's how that works. Nice, uh, very nice service they set up. I don't know if they if they publicize that as part of what they offer, but uh, but that's they they told me what to do and I did it and it worked. <laughs> Any other questions? Let's see. Let me look through my notes and see what we missed on talking about. There were things. Oh, you know, I didn't touch on much of the JavaScript. I'm gonna look at a couple of JavaScript tricks on the Maplet side of code. I'll, we'll do that if anybody's interested. Um, a few things that you can do. Some of this will apply to other stuff besides uh, this. This is just general JavaScript stuff that I kind of stumbled across as I was going along. Um, Map.js, okay. So, I'm looking at the wrong one. I, I changed my order of things I was doing things in, so I'm let me see if I find this really quick. This looks bad on YouTube. I don't look organized now. It's okay. Everything looks bad on YouTube. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> I hope, hopefully, people will be able to see some of that. No, I meant there are other videos. 
Oh, good. <laughs> Selection. Let's see. Let me let me see if I have this code here. Mike, just a quick question. Yeah, yeah, Mono. Um, is uh, that Shape Utils uh, library? Is that uh, what license is that released under? The Shape Utils, the one for Python. Yes. Um, B BSD -ish or not much of any license. I don't think. Let's see. I don't know if you put a copyright on it even. So I don't know what I don't know what the license is. I, I probably should know. I think he said I think he said it was open source BSD style something or other. But it'd be probably good to check on that. Actually, it may be on the top of the file. Let's see if it is. Have you tried out that live KML, the new thing that just came out from Google? No, I haven't yet. That, oh, so, that, you, so, yeah. that, so you don't know if HPricot is as good as live KML? I have no idea on that. Yeah, I haven't tried live, live KML yet. That looked pretty cool, though. Yeah, you know, he, he, he just said take the code and use it. He didn't really put a copyright or what license he was doing, but he, he, he made it pretty clear from his site that he said do what you want with it. So I should probably ask him to put a more formal license on it so we know what we're doing with it. Um, but let me get that JavaScript code I was going to look at here. If I have it here. Do, 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 do. <coughs> okay, okay, now I'm organized. Okay, so... One thing, since I'm doing all this JSON stuff and then downloading uh, code do into JavaScript, downloading the data into JavaScript, and then generating HTML code in the JavaScript, um, the question is, well, how do you do that? You've probably seen a lot of code that looks kind of like this. Um, you know, take some HTML, start appending to it, appending to it, appending to it, you know, do some of it inside a loop, append some more stuff at the end, make sure you close your tag down there. See, we've got a dig ta div tag up at the top. We're closing the div tag at the bottom. We've got stuff in the middle. This is kind of, you know, I've written a lot of code that looks like this. Um, and this is not very efficient, actually, because all of these, all of these uh, JavaScript concatenations, all the string concatenation, depending on the browser, it can be really slow. If you just start concatenating a large number of strings, uh, it's probably even worse if I didn't do all the plus equals, but I just did one big, long string concatenation. I don't know which is worse, but doing a lot of string concatenation in JavaScript in many browsers, not all, uh, can be pretty slow. So you can improve on that a lot in terms of performance by putting stuff in an array and then um, and then taking and taking the the array and then doing a join on that and I see I this is example code I was doing on the fly earlier I can see that I didn't do this one right you'll, you'll often do this you so I end up with a code like this set up a, an array at the beginning now here instead of the the old-fashioned for loop for var, var i equals etc I'm using a for each, which is in the newer versions of JavaScript, and then I also have my own implementation of it up at the top. Uh, on, on, the, uh, um, on the Gecko DOM site, they've got actually code for all of these, the ones they've implemented newly that you can just grab their code and put it for old versions. So I've got, either way, I've got that code, and it's a little less efficient, but it's really nice to write code when you can just do a for each. If you write Ruby code, you're used to doing it this way. This is a lot like how you do pretty much everything in Ruby. Um, but so, so so I do a, a, an events dot for each now, and then an inside of that I'm going to push onto my list. And what I'm pushing, this shouldn't actually be an array here. That should say join at the end. And uh, so now what I've got, I, I'm doing this piece of code right here, which is an array, an array of um, strings. And uh, then I join them all at the end. That's on, on, again, on not every browser, but on most browsers, it's much more f efficient, especially if I have a lot of them, than doing the string concatenation. It's not much worse than any browser. Some browsers actually do have the, the concatenation optimized, so this doesn't improve on it. Maybe, and it may be even marginally slower, but it's not enough to worry about. And on some browsers, it's so much faster that you really just want to go ahead and do it this way. The only problem is with this, as you can see, I, I often forget that join at the end, and I end up pushing an array, and I see in my HTML I'm generating not what I expected because I get a bunch of commas when it tried to join stuff together unexpectedly. So, so there's a little improvement you can make to that, which is, this, oh, this is the same code basically. Again, a little improvement to that, which I came up with, which is this, my favorite one-line JavaScript function, and I call it S, because I use it a lot, I made it short, S for string. And S for string simply is a function that takes any number of arguments, um, just multiple arguments to the function, makes those into an array, and then concatenates them very efficiently. And the way that works, this is just like, this is a cool little thing you can do in JavaScript. Um, 
it's, it's the very one line function that's just really slick. Now the problem, see the arguments in array in JavaScript, if you ever tried to work with it, it's not a real JavaScript array, it doesn't have a join method. It doesn't have a lot of the methods that arrays have. It's like an array, you can index through it, uh, it's got a dot length property, but that's about it. It doesn't have any, it doesn't have join, any of the other stuff you expect. But what you can do is do this. So, so what I'm doing is array.prototype. I want to get the real join method that the array object uses. And that, of course, is in array.prototype.join. That's the prototype for every array object. So I get the join method for the real array object. And then I do that, I, I do the call on that, which says, okay, call that method. I want to call this method that I've gotten here, but I want to call it using this as this. Whatever first parameter you give there, that's going to be the this object that that method's operating on. So I've essentially coerced the arguments in an array into having a join method that it wouldn't have otherwise, without having to copy the array, without having to do any of that. So this actually works pretty efficiently. It calls, it calls the join method of a real array on the arguments array. You could do this with any other missing method like that. If there's other array methods, that arguments object doesn't have, this is a way to get them in there. I did the same trick. Um, one of the functions in jQuery is, the, is um, if you do jQuery, you do that HTML to, to set the inner HTML of a, of a DOM object. The only problem with HTML is, that, again, it only takes a single argument. So I did a little extension to the, to the jQuery HTML here that lets it take multiple arguments because I, I started to like this style of coding. I'm just being able to put a list of strings, let it all concatenate them together. I don't have to worry about it. So I did that for jQuery as well. Um, another r really useful uh, u function, there's two of them that I, that I really find useful. These ones at the top here, this is the for each. This is how you implement for each if you don't have the native one. Same thing for map. Um, you, know, you guys know what an array.map is? For each, of course, iterates over an array and then calls a function with each, each, uh, each of the elements of the array passed into that function. Um, the, the, map, the map function does that same thing. It calls a method repeatedly, but then it, it, uh, it then pushes all of those into a new array and returns that array. So when you map an array, you're essentially taking an array, processing each element of it through a function, and then returning an array that's all of those elements concatenated back together into an array. And so that code is here. We don't need to go into the details of that, but it's really useful. That's, that's, uh, that, that you, you start to do this functional style of JavaScript programming, and uh, it, uh, it can really make the code more maintainable. Um, here's one that, that I came up with it's, that I use all over the place. It's, it's um, an index method for arrays. What this does, it's actually an index method for arrays of either string or object. So I can take a, I can take a string. The, the code to it's not too interesting, but let's look at uh, where I use this. So I can take, take an array of, of objects like this. Here's, here's my candidates array for this particular application. This is the, the camp, campaign trail we just looked at. So I've got an array. I can index that candidates of one is this object for Hillary Clinton. Excuse me, that's candidates of zero. Candidates of one is the next one, McCain, you know, two for Obama. But I also want to be able to quickly access one of these by name. And in, my, in the earlier primaries, we had like, you know, what, 20 or so candidates. So it, it, you, you could, of course, do that by writing a loop. Given a name, I could loop through candidates and search for the one that has the matching name. But I added this method to the array object that says index the thing. And here's the field I want to index it on. Index this array by the name, the name property of each object in the array. So now what I can do, like I said, I can do candidates equals candidates of zero, get one of the candidates, you know, explicitly, or I can say candidates by n name and give a name here. And this could be, you know, name is equals Obama. And of course here I, I would be a name I've gotten in from some other code someplace. It wouldn't, wouldn't be right here. If I knew, if I knew it right there, I'd just do the, uh, the string. But this, this lets you very, very efficiently, it takes a little while to set up the index, but not really long. It's just one loop, one loop through the array, one time to make the index. And then from then on, it's in the hash table that JavaScript uses for objects. So, so candidates, in addition to having the numeric uh, um, properties, is also sprouted now with my index function, uh, the by name. And if, if you index by some other property, let's look at another index here. Um, you know, here's, here's one that I index by ID, by events. Each, this is in the, the event sidebar in this, this gadget. 
uh, each event, I've, I've given it an ID which came from the original feed. And then I want to also be able to index those by events. So I, so I've got, um, I, I, I take my object, first I sort it, index it by ID, so now I can do events by ID, and whatever ID I had that came in from someplace, I can get to it very quickly. And that's how I can link up on the sidebar and the markers on the map, be able to have one of them, and actually I haven't written all the code to make those hook up completely, but I can have one of them, like you click on the sidebar, it brings up the, the marker, click on a marker, it'll highlight the one in the sidebar, do stuff to tie them together easily. Uh, and then the last, the last function related is a sort, a sort method. Who's, who's done sorting of a large array in JavaScript? You know what happens? Or especially a large array of objects. It's very slow. You can, you can write a sort for an array of strings and it'll sort by string. Or you can write a sort and you can give a callback function and that callback function gets called for every compare. And you know when you're doing a sort, even with a good sort algorithm, whatever they're using, it's still going to do a lot of callbacks to that callback because they've got to compare a lot of times. It's not just one, ta one time through the array and do one comparison. It's every time they decide whether they want to swap two elements or whatever algorithm, they've got to do a, a, you know, do a callback to your function, which is going to compare two properties or whatever you're going to do. So I wrote this other sort function. Let's split this and go up to the top here. So this, the sort function that I wrote, that I use here, is takes a different approach. Um, I didn't think up the approach. Other people have done this before. But what you do is make one pass through the array of objects. So I, I take, I make a first pass, oh, that's hard to read that way. Let's go back to where we were. One, one pass through the array of objects and I, and I create an array of strings out of that. And I did, this I've got uh, quite a bit of duplicate code because I tried to optimize the inner loops here. I didn't want to have any if tests inside the inner loops. So. So, so, I, so I did this you know, with separate loops for each one. You can do numeric or you can do a, a string values. And what I do is I'm, I go through the whole array, pick up each, like I said, array index by name. I pick up each of those name properties. I build up a string array with those names in it because then I can sort that string array very quickly. I can pass the string array into JavaScript. It sorts it internally with fast C code. doesn't have to call back to my function every time. Then I can take that array when I'm done with it and then break that back out to, uh, to the output array that, that has the original objects in them, uh, but, uh, but now in sorted order. So I do have to make a couple passes through it. I make one pass through the whole array here. In, in, it's gonna be in any one of these cases, depending. I make one pass through the array to generate a string array. Then I tell JavaScript to sort it. And then I make a second pass through the sorted array, breaking it back out. On a short array, that would be a lot of overhead. You wouldn't want to do that. But if you have a long array, it might have, you know, some of these have got hundreds, uh, more than hundreds even, you know, 500 even in some of these arrays. If you have an array of, you know, doing anything in JavaScript with sorting an array with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of objects in it, you really want to take this approach where you can let JavaScript do the work by having it, you're breaking it down to a string array, let it sort that and then do this. Um, so I'll, this, this code I'll have all, uh, this, this is actually all in Google code, but I'll have links to all the appropriate ones here on my blog here. So so you can uh, find some of this code and feel free to use it any way you like. Uh, and with that, I think I'm about out of things to talk about for tonight and it's almost eight o'clock. Any last questions or anything? Uh, can you for the JavaScript for the performance? How do you find out the volume? Okay. Um, How do you figure out where the bottleneck is with respect to the code execution? Well, you, the best thing, of course, always is profiling. Uh, Firebug has a really good profi profiler in it that's easy to use. And of course, that's specific to Firefox. It won't show you where the bottlenecks necessarily are, are in IE, which is probably going to be worse for a lot of things. But for, for a quick ballpark to say, well, what's, what are my really worst cases? Chances are, if you use the Firebug profiler, that it's going to give you a pretty good idea. In, in some cases, on some of these, I just knew from experience, I knew that sort, sorting a long array with a callback in JavaScript, I just knew that's a bottleneck. Whether it really is in the size of arrays I'm using or not, though I had you know I had the code already from a project where I had to sort a much longer array, so 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 we used that. But uh, but yeah, profiling. Uh, sometimes it's intuition like this, but you, more often it should be profiling. And uh, there, I think there's a profiler for IE as well. I don't know what it's called, um, and maybe one for Safari. I'm not sure because you really would want to do each of those separately to to really see which one has its own bottlenecks. Anything else? 
Okay, well, I'm talked out. You're listened out. I'll post uh, links and the stuff on my blog. And thank you all for coming.